Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today in our first webinar section. And today we'll be focusing on how to diversify into the tech space. We've got three speaker for you. We have Shaitan, we have Wemi, and myself. At the same time, we have Tayo, which is one of our mentors, and she'll be helping us out with the chat room today. So today, this program is brought to you by STEM Girls Initiative. It's a mentorship program. We focus on um, female empowerment. We try to empower the female students from Nigeria, actually. If you're in STEM and you're looking for a mentor, and probably you have one, or you're looking to have one to his, or you don't even have a time in STEM field, and you're looking to have a better career in STEM, please reach out to us. We'll be speaking more about that towards the end of the section. But this is brought to you by STEM Girls Initiative. And for today's agenda, we'll be going through, for the first one half of the webinar, we'll be talking about, um, We'll try to introduce. I'll try to introduce the words of the speakers, and the first two speakers will mainly be talking about how they transition into the tech space itself, because they did transition transition into tech space, and they will talk to you about their experience, what they are doing right now, what they've done so far, and how to also like build those soft skills that will help you in your career journey. And lastly, I will be coming here to talk mostly about data science, since I didn't really transition. I'll be talking about data science, which is part of most asked questions from the questions you guys actually asked so far. And for the second half of the webinar section, it will be focused on questions and answers. And the way we actually want to bring to this to you is that, that's why we're telling you, please make use of the chat room to ask any questions you want to ask right now. Tayo is taking care of that, she's compiling your questions and her. So any question, any opinion, any feedback you want to give us, even go ahead, you can go ahead and even introduce yourself, the school you're from, what you're doing right now. We all welcome want to know you better. And for the first second half of the sorry, the second half of the webinar, we'll be taking questions from the chat room first. Then we'll go back to the pre-asked questions. The pre-asked questions are the questions you guys asked when you submitted your application. So we've actually selected like almost 20 of the question, uh, questions which we actually filtered based on priority, the need to answer the question, and also we filter based on repetition and how. So we'll be answering those 20 questions and hopefully we'll still have time. Then we'll go back to the chat room again and we'll pick more questions. So please make sure your questions are not what has been answered before. So try to ask us those questions that are really, really bothering you. And hopefully we we'll get everything done before the end of what's it called that uh, too. Before the end of the time assigned for this meeting. So right now I'm going to pass it. Pass the mic over to Shaitan. She'll be talking about trans how she transitioned to the tech space. Thank you, Shaitan. Hello, everybody. Good um, afternoon. Just give me one second while I share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Mm, not yet. Yes, come on. Huh? Still now, I can only see O, like like the initial of your name. I don't know what. <laughs> I can only see. I can see you. It's still recording. I don't know what happened. I've stopped sharing. Can you try now? So I will walk. All right, can you see my screen now? Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Uh, all right, perfect. One second, please. It's still recording, right? Yeah. All right, thank you all so much for joining us today. I really do appreciate your time. And thank you, Okwe, for that introduction. Um, today, like Okwe had mentioned, we'll be talking about transitioning into the tech world or transitioning into the tech space. And like 
said, my name is Oluwa Shaitan Wojabi. You all can call me Shaitan. You can call me Shay. Whichever works for you. I know that my name is long already. So anyone that works for you is fine. Um, before I go into tell you about myself, um, I would like to kind of, I would like for us to, to set the rules of engagement. Right, number one, I cannot see you guys, and you probably cannot see me as well. So therefore, I like you all to be very engaged in the chat window. So tell us about yourself, tell us what school you're from, tell us what you're doing. If anything is not making sense, let me know. I love this presentation, and I'll be saying things like, does that make sense, is that clear? You know, things like that. So make sure that you're engaging, or else I'll just stop, just because, you know, I can't. <laughs> but um, about myself, I started my educational journey or educational career as an art student and then I pursued a bachelor's in banking and finance and then a master's degree in data science. Currently I'm a technical account manager at Microsoft and I also own a non-governmental organization called Develop in Africa and the goal really is to empower you to the entrepreneurial skills and self-development skills for free or at an added discounted price. Um, while we do that, uh, now that you all know a lot about me or everything about me technically, let's go into agenda. For today, We'll be doing a little bit of did you know, so some fun facts, some things you probably already know, you probably do not know. Um, we'll go into the tips of how to start your career in technology. We go also into the skills that you need to start that career in technology, both the art skills and the soft skills. Now that we have all of that information, we go into what the next steps is. Now that you have all of the skills, the tips needed, how do you, what do you do next, right? And then at the end of the call, we're going to take questions and answer all of the questions that you need. Does that make sense? Is that clear? All right. I'm expecting that you all are responding in the chat window. But moving on, now with this next slide, you all are probably going to say, uh, Shaita, um, you know, this is why, why is everybody always talking about girls, 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 girls? But I promise you, this is this webinar, we're going to try as much as possible to make it as inclusive as possible. So both guys and girls, everybody is welcome here and you're going to learn something. But just stay with me and be patient because, I mean, as we know, the the challenge with people migrating or pursuing a career in technology has a lot more to do with ladies than it has to do with guys. And that's why this particular slide is here. Now, did you know that girls typically we start will we'll be interested in tech, pursuing a technology career when they're about 11 or before at least they get to like 15. Now imagine, let's, let, me, let me make it clear. Think about your younger sister or a cousin that you have that is a lady. And when she was much younger, she wanted to build robots. She wanted to pursue a career in technology. She wanted to do all of this fun, interesting, amazing stuff. But someone she sees as a maybe a father figure, a mentor, or whatever, starts feeding out with the lies of, hey, girl, you can't do this. This is only meant for guys. Now, that is the problem that we are facing in the real world. A research done by Microsoft said or has, has let us know that girls typically will gain interest in STEM at the age of 11, but when they get to about 15, they start losing interest. Why is that happening? Or why do you think that happens? Some of the reasons they have said is because of social factors, because they have lacked, they lack access to resources or things that they can use to, you know, um, to pursue that career or to succeed in that career. Now, another thing that you all should know is 74% of middle school girls typically would express interest in pursuing, you know, an engineering degree, a science degree, or a, a degree in technology. But then by the time they actually get to college, which is university in Nigeria or in Africa, only 0.3% finally or decide to choose a computer science as a major. That is like a huge, huge gap. And that is something we totally need to fix. And that's why we have organizations or initiatives like the STEM Girls Initiative, who is coming together to mentor these girls, to guide them through the process of pursuing a career in technology. Now, the final thing and the last thing that people would say is, Ashita, this one that you guys are, you know, saying everybody should pursue career technology. Would there be jobs for the whole world? <laughs> would there be jobs for everybody to pursue a career technology? And the truth is, yes. 
there, I feel like personally, I feel like there will be, there would always be a need or there will always be a role in technology. Think of it like the normal distribution curve. There's always, even with coronavirus, we say, oh my God, there's going to be a peak and that there's going to be a flattening of the curve, right? So there's going to be, there's always a peak in everything. There's a peak in economy and then we get depression. But would there ever be a peak in technology? I don't think so. The only reason why we're all communicating today, I mean, Nigeria, I mean, I'm in the US, y'all are in Nigeria, Canada, watching from all over the world. The only reason why we can do that today is because of technology. So there would always be a need for technology. I recently read also that even in this COVID situation, Amazon has hired additional 10,000 people. That's to show you that as we keep growing along the uh, along life or across the world, whatever, we would always find a need for technology. So don't be scared. Don't be worried that, oh, my God, if I pursue a career in technology, there won't be a job. There would always be a job for you. You just need to take that first step of learning the skills that you need. Does that make sense? All right. Now, as we're going through the key transition tips, um, I'm going to pretty much be telling you a lot of stories, but I will try and connect the dots for you. Now, what's the first thing you need to have or you need to do if you're studying a career in technology? The first thing like, like I have on my slide here is to know your passion, identify your passion. For me, one thing is I like numbers, right? But beyond liking numbers, I also identify the problem. So for you, it might not just be a passion. It might be a problem that you identify that you want to solve. For me, it was I like numbers. I identified a problem. I was working in the aviation. I work in the aviation industry at the banking industry before I pursued a master's degree in data science. But I cannot tell you that I had a clear plan on, oh my God, data science. Is this data science that will solve the problem of the, life, of the world? No, I didn't have that. I had no clue, right? What I knew, however, is y'all will come to the back. You know, when you used to come to the back, I don't be angry at everybody. Or you go in, or you call like a customer service representative and just be cursing them out. You know the way you guys do that, right? I was, I was on the receiving end of that. But one thing that I identified was all of these compl complaints that you all had, they were valid. They were things that if we could put together, either way, data that we could collect, derive insights and get back into the business with great ideas and great innovation. But that wasn't necessarily happening. And that's not to tell you that, oh, like I said, I didn't have it figured out. I didn't say, oh, no, this is the problem. This is the solution. I just knew that this is something that was messing up with my head and I needed to fix. Now, one day, and this takes us to the next point. One day, my brother calls me. He was my, at the, in this case, he was my mentor. Your mentor can be anyone else. It can be someone from SGI. It can be from anywhere. My brother calls me and he's like, oh, Shaitan, so now, yeah, I finished school. Yeah, I'm working. Yeah, I do all of this good stuff. What's next? Ah. <laughs> I hate when they ask you questions like that. I was like, to be honest, I have no idea because at the time, I was probably like 21 or 22. And I'm like, brother, I'm just trying to figure out my life at this time. Like, I'm trying to understand my purpose. You know, that's the cliche thing everybody says. Understand your purpose. He was like, um, Shaitan, you need to think about it. What do you want to do? I was like, okay, if I'm thinking of a master's degree, maybe I can do economics. I mean, economics is still, I started banking and finance. Economics is the next step, right? Or banking, something finance is the next step. And he didn't argue with me. He was like, okay, as long as you're, you're still doing masters, I'm fine. So we started that process. I took a lot of exams. And to be honest, I failed. Not like failed, failed. But I didn't have the level of the numbers of the scores that I wanted, right? So I went ahead to, can you please mute your call? Oh, All right. Um, I went ahead to, I took a drastic decision. I took a drastic decision of resigning. Excuse me, please. I don't know your phone. If you're calling him, please can you mute yourself? Because right now everyone on the what's call webinar. I've muted everyone on webinar. If you're using your phone. Please mute yourself. All right, I'll go ahead. 
So we went ahead to, I went ahead to resign. I mean, I was well paid at the time. I was not, it's not like I was suffering or anything, but I needed to make that decision of what's the next step for me. I had taken these exams while working, but it wasn't, wasn't working out. So I decided to resign. I came to the US on my life savings, literally. I used to come here and started studying and then studying for all these exams and things like that. But the point is for me to have actually made that move in the first place, I had needed a mentor. And my, my brother being the fact that he was also in technology was one that kind of encouraged me to kind of think differently of, it doesn't have to be economics, it can be something else. Right, so I started researching, researching, and then I came across data science. I'm like, oh, this actually sounds like something that, that aligns with what I'm trying to achieve, meaning all my frustrations in the bank. Data science can help me solve that. Now, the next thing is identify and leverage your strength. To be honest, I, I can say that, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to tell you all this aspire to inspire all those, you know, motivational speaking stuff. But the truth is, but the truth is, for me, I was 100% poor in mathematics when I was much younger. I mean, I love numbers. By the time I was in my grad undergrad, I loved numbers. I was excellent in finance. But in, under, in secondary school, it wasn't always like that. I was a failure. <laughs> Let me say I was a failure, but I was really bad in math. Like they got me a lesson teacher. The person probably did a great job, but it still was not helping. But the reason why I could so but trust the point of identifying and leveraging your strength. The reason why I could go into data science, a course that requires a lot of identifying numbers, attention to details and things like that, was because I identified that, yes, I love numbers, I'm good with numbers and things like that. Now, the truth, again, is that goes to the next point of learning style. Like I said, when I was much younger, I was very, very poor in mathematics, like 100% poor. But I had this math teacher who changed the game for me. I went to um, Isikawa Private College, and there was this much called Mr. Johnny. Oh my God! Like before Mr. Johnny, I was I was poor. Like I was legit the lowest in the class. But once he came in, I started teaching. It became easier for me. I started having B's and A's, and my parents were legit shook. They were like, "Jeta, good job." <laughs> but the thing is. The reason why I say that is when you start your journey into technology, you're going to feel like this is stressful. This is ever stressful. I cannot deal with this. I don't even understand all of this crap that you're saying. But you just need to find resources. You need to find content that are aligned to you. You need to find things that can help you learn it better and assimilate better. And for me, I used a lot of resources. I used Coursera, Udemy, YouTube, and things like that. But it wasn't what everyone, and if anybody knows me, you know that I'm not patient. I'm a very patient person. Like, I just want things that I can look at, understand it, and move on, right? So I had to find something that could help me understand better. So if you're on this call, you're trying to move into technology, you've probably been looking for resources that are not helping you out. Maybe speak to someone that you think has the same learning style as you do. Maybe try to do some more research or resources that can help you better help you understand whatever it is you are learning. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. um, the next thing is deliberate practice. Now, there's a difference. Study is different from study. Study ethos is study, right? Like, sorry if I speak your rap, but you need to understand, like, there's a difference between studying and studying. I can be looking at a book right now, for example. I can pick up this book and just looking at it for the sake of looking but that doesn't mean that I'm deliberately reading it I'm just trying to pass time but as you're trying or moving or going into technology you need to learn to deliberately practice so pick say for example you're trying to learn Python say by when May right now be April right now by June 2020 I want to have I want to, on a scale of one to ten I want to be at least a seven in Python and then focus your focus on that on that studying. Don't try and deviate. Don't try and do, I want to do everything at the same time. Don't try to do ITK. Do the one that you can do and focus on it, right? Whatever you want to learn, and whoever knows me will tell you this, there is nothing that is difficult. 
as long as you put your mind to it. So deliberately practice. And the thing is, the moment you're practicing, it becomes easy for you to implement after a while. But you need to have put that effort in. There's a book called Outliers, um, and it, it gives you the 10,000 hour rule, where the more you practice, the more you put time and effort into things, it becomes, it becomes to reflect in your output, right? And the final thing is you need to volunteer and intern. Now, I know this sounds like, because a lot of people these days, you guys are looking for, people are looking for ways to make quick money. Oh, like how to do website design, just so I can make it to 50 grand per website, fast, fast, sharp, sharp. The truth is not that easy. You have to develop your skills. You need to raise a standard. Okay, I want to develop website design. I want to develop websites. But are you trying to develop websites at the, at the mediocre level or at an excellent level? So you need to volunteer, intern at, intern at places, equip your skills. For me, I had mentors who could guide me through that process and I could have volunteer opportunities. I applied for jobs for free. I'll give you a story. When I was doing my grad school, and the thing again is, when I go, let's go back to practice for a little bit. Practicing can be as little as what you observe in your environment. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not a very patient person. So when I'm driving, I like to drive, I always go fast, right? It's no slowing down for me. But the truth is, in that process, I realized that people in front of me typically would just be pressing brake anyhow, just be doing boom, boom, pressing brake and distracting people at the back. Now, that little observation was what I started using for my under my grad project. I started collecting data. I started analyzing that data to see if there's a correlation. Um, correlation simply means if there's a relationship between the people who are driving, what is making them distracted? The road is free, there's no traffic. Why are you pressing your brake anyhow, right? And that was a project that my professor was really impressed. He wanted me to take it large and big. So practicing, those of me are practicing aimlessly. It can just be something little. There are so many resources with data that you can get data from and start analyzing for a purpose, right? So volunteer and internet places so that you're positioning yourself in the right places that can later on get you the job that you want. So if, for example, you want to become a digital marketer, it can be as little as that. Start volunteering for people and say, I want to be a digital marketer for you. Or you want to be a data scientist. Start going mm -hmm. online, do GitHub, do things like that. Get research and, and just volunteer. So when you now want to apply for a real job, your interview is going to be based off what you already practiced on, on the volunteer opportunities you have leveraged. For me, when I started doing interviews, I just used to bobo them. I'll say that, that I did this research on the correlation between people pressing their brakes and this, and people love this. Like when I started, I'm like, oh my God, that's so amazing. It's not anything, I wasn't paid to do that, but it was a project that I did based off your observation, based off the little things. So at the end of this, the, more, at least the summary of this is the little things that matter, right? Just identify your strength and leverage it and make sure that you're implementing whatever it is that you learn. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so on the next slide, we'll go into what skills that you need life there are different skills relevant you need your soft skills and the art skills life would teach you soft skills you don't, you don't need anybody to teach you soft skills life would teach you that but for as you begin your journey in technology there are some there are certain art skills that you need and i've listed some of those this might not apply to everybody this might just be for a selected few reason being that depending on the area you want to focus on in technology right um, and this on the right hand side, you also see some of the top art skills that is currently trending by um, by that by based off research. So if you want to focus on anything, these are the top things that you could consider leveraging into. Um, now, what's the next step? The next step is to go ahead, seek out professional courses, certifications, degree to pursue. It doesn't have to be a master's degree. That was what worked for me. But for you, it could be a professional course. It could be a certification. Research available funding opportunities. I didn't have funding opportunities at the beginning. But I, I started researching. I started applying. And that was how I was able to put myself through school. Also, like I said, practice deliberately. Determine your learning style. 
and volunteer. Do we have any questions that y'all want to, you guys want to, you know, ask? Just put it in the chat window and we will get to it as soon as possible. But that's all I had for you today. Please stay connected. You can send me an email if you have any questions, if you need anything. Send me an email. You can reach out to me on social media. Sheita, Uluwa Sheita, Ojabi, Sheita Ojabi, whichever it is. I'm available. I'm always happy to help. So reach out to me. And that will be all for today. Thank you guys so much. I will be sharing this slide to you guys after the call. So you can always um, take a look at it and use it for whatever it is you want to use it for. Thank you guys. Thank you, Ada. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we move on to Baby Sola Ojo. She's also going to be talking about how she transitioned from mechanical engineering to cloud. Over to you, Baby. Cool. Um, can everyone see my screen? Can you see the presentation on the screen? Mm, not yet. Second. Um, sorry, guys. I need to try again. Sorry, please bear with me. Just. Oh, uh, second. Okay. Right. Okay. We should be there now. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Thanks. So hello everybody. Um, I hope you guys are having a great time so far. Please, if you haven't introduced yourself, please do that in the chat window. That's why we have the chat window. Tell us your name what you do and yeah anything else you want us to know about you so please put in the chat window and yeah let's know let's get to know you let's get to know you right so i'm just gonna get started can everyone hear me if you can hear me please type yes in the chat window as well please <laughs> i need to be sure i'm not speaking to myself okay cool cool thank you thank you so much everyone so yeah i'm going to share my journey today about how i moved from mechanical engineering um to cloud right okay so let me tell you guys a bit about myself. So my name is Bim Salaoju, like we said earlier, and I did my BS in mechanical engineering um, at UI. If we have any UI people in the house, please put in the chat window. <laughs> Greatest UI. Okay, so I did that. Um, I studied mechanical engineering, and then I moved over to the UK to do my master's in mechanical engineering again. And shortly after, oh yeah, I can see some great UI. Awesome, awesome. So shortly after that, I got a technology job with Accenture, and um, which is what I'm currently doing as a cloud DevOps engineer. And I'm also the founder of the Outstanding Professionals Network, which I'll tell you about later. My best food is of Father Rice and Ayamashi. Do we have anybody else that likes that? Okay. <laughs> so that's my best food, right? Today, I'm going to be talking about why I transitioned into technology. I'll tell you um, about some job roles that are available in tech. Seems to be a successful career in tech. Shaita already covered, you know, how do you transition into tech? So I'm going to be letting you know, you know, after you transition into tech, how do you then build a successful career? And then what resources can you use? People always ask questions around resources. What resources can you use? And then questions afterwards, okay? Why did I move from engineering to technology? Um, well, uh, I believe that technology is the future, right? And at this point, um, yeah so at this point um engineering is you know engineering has to do with hands-on things in engineering the focus is not really on software or you know what's going to power what you're doing you're just focusing on the physical components especially mechanical engineering it's mainly about interaction of mechanical parts you know thermodynamics engineering so many things there and the truth is anyone in engineering or science right now needs to actually think about engine needs to think about software development and technology because that's the future okay that's the future so i believe very strongly i always tell people that a combination of engineering or science and software development it's just that's what people should be focusing on these days engineering is no longer a field that should be in isolation from technology or software development so that's what i was thinking it was more of a futuristic thing like what's the point okay and of course i also had an opportunity to take up a technology job which is very important you know and that was why i moved on into of course there was passion too as well so the next thing i would say is critical thinking analytical reasoning and your creativity is at work every day this is something else i love about tech because oh my god like 
you're not because i mean for people that school in universities in nigeria for example there's some people call a crown lab for like there were so many things we didn't understand in engineering you just had to do it right you just had to <laughs> you just had to learn you know you, i mean you just had to give the lecturers back in fact i remember in you i had some lecturers actually told us back then that man this course i'll give you i just wanted to grab it i'll give it back to me i imagine lecturers saying things like that you know so it's you know there was that side of it but moving on to real life i really didn't want to do that anymore what's the point like for me i'm always asking a question and that's what i encourage you guys to ask as well anything that you're learning now you're investing so much time into it always ask yourself why am i learning this how is this relevant in the world if you can't see any relevance or any relevance in the next 20 30 years please consider adding some new things to what you're learning so that's one thing i love about technology you know that your critical thinking your analytical reasoning you're thinking every day you're being creative as you're writing code or as you're deploying code or as you're carrying out your task it's not possible to just cram anything and pour it in tech you know you need to actually understand what you're doing and you're making use of your brain power which is something i like to do so now the next point is a degree actually gives you transferable skills this is also another important point i'd like you guys to go with the fact that you studied law or you studied engineering or you studied science or you studied art or you, studied, you just had Shaitan's story, it doesn't mean that's what you're destined to be. I mean, come to think about it, when did we, at what age did we make all these decisions about what course we want to study? I mean, you were in secondary school and then you don't even know some random factors affected you, you became an art student or a science student, or maybe your teacher told you, oh, because of your grades, you can only do science, you know, you do science. And meanwhile, your passion is in art, you know. So the thing is, I feel like a lot of us might have made decisions out of maybe parental influence, teachers influence, random people's opinion. When you finish your degree, I always encourage people, finish your degree, get the best grade you can. But after you finish your degree, think about it. Is this really what I want to do? Your life is not destined or tied to that course that you studied. That's not the summary of your life. You can choose to move on to something completely, which is what some of us here have done. I mean, you know, you can decide that you want something completely different. It doesn't matter. You can be an art student and decide you want to go into science. You can be science, you can decide to go into art. As long as, you know, you're ready to put in the effort because there's no shortcut to success and that's the last point that i'm saying like you know why did i move into tech again anyone can do it as long as you remain persistent so and this applies to tech it also applies to any field that you decide to do as well like your persistence your diligence your hard work these are the things that make up for success so it's very important for you to know from the third point that what a degree does for you is to give you transferable skills. You can decide to change into something else and you can decide to continue in it if that's really what you want. But make sure that whatever it is that you decide to pursue as a career is something futuristic because the way technology is going, a lot of jobs are going to be displaced. So now let me move on to tips to build a successful career. Okay, let me do like Shayto. Are you guys listening? Does that make sense? <laughs> Please put you in the chat box. <laughs> If what I said so far makes sense. I can't see any yes. Oh my God, I'm not making sense. Whoop. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Now, next, um, it says, um, so the next thing I'll talk about is listening that is making sense. Thank you. Cool. Tips to build a successful career in technology. You know, after you've gotten into tech, using the tips that um, Chaita has shared, how do you build a successful career? You know, it's very important for you to be clear at every point in time, you know, Anything that is worthwhile, building a successful career in tech is very similar to building a successful life anyway. You know, you need to understand what you're interested in. You know, I'm sure you've, you've already kind of understood that when you've been into tech, when you've entered into tech. But you need to be sure what you're doing, does it suit your personality? Because the truth is you don't give your best self if you're not working based on your true your true values. If you're someone that doesn't really like interacting with people, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're someone that you know you just like to keep to yourself, you just like to get the job done, you just like to go deep into the work and get the job done. You're probably someone that is very suited for a software developer. Can everyone go on mute? I hope I won't have to call people's names. Uh, Ebenezer, I'll meet Togo, please. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So, think about it. What area are you interested in? Does this suit your personality? So, like I said, for me, um, I do DevOps at work. And, you know, I know that DevOps doesn't just involve, like, software development, even though that's an aspect of it. There's also that part of interacting with people across the um, life cycle interacting with developers with testers with all of these people so it my job is not just to sit down all day and coding you know but 
So you need to think about so because I'm a people person, I can actually really get bored if all I have to do every day is to just focus. Like if I don't talk to human beings, I can't survive. Like that's the kind of person I am. So my job role has to give me the opportunity to interact with people. Meanwhile, there's so many people in my office that almost their own is just to get the job done. They can talk to you, they can say hi, but their own is just to get the job done. So you need to think about it. What are you interested in that what suits your person and begin to invest in that? So clarity is extremely important. Anything you want to do, always set a goal. Always set a goal. When you start your tech career, always think about in the next one year, where do I want to be? In the next five years, where do I want to be? In the next Ten years when I want to be, and there's no pressure because it can change. But at least at that point, you have a goal that you're pursuing, and it keeps moving you in the right direction and moving you forward. And also, the last point here is what jobs are being demanded in the next ten to thirty years. So even within tech, while you're building your successful career, always be sure that you know what you're doing would be relevant in the next 10 to 30 years. I've heard of software developers who have moved into DevOps. Some software developers have moved into product management. So product managers have moved into different pro project management. I'll tell you more about job roles in tech, but always be aware, always invest in resources and be aware of what will be relevant, what will be in demand in the next 10 to 30 years. There's so many trends online. Shaito also covered this already, you know. So always be sure that everything you're doing, that your efforts will not just be wasted at some point. Uh, 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 yeah, building up on how to build your successful career. I always say something about building your toolbox, okay? So after you've recognized that, okay, I want to continue software development, I want to move into DevOps. So this is it's very important yeah, yeah. for you always. Can everyone mute, please? Olu, oh, bad yeah. mistake. Okay. Now, uh, please, okay. everyone should go with. Uh, okay. That's right. Oh, bad baby, so you lose your family. Please. Uh, you tell him. You can go ahead. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, now. One thing I always say, build your toolbox, identify your skills gaps and do regular self-assessment. See, one thing I've learned from life after uni is this, like, you know, when you're in secondary school, you know, your teacher grades you, they tell you that this is what you've scored in social studies, this is what you've scored in literature, this is what you've done this. In university, your lecturers do the same thing as well. They do your assessment for you. They tell you that, oh, this is how you've scored in this, you know, this is your grade, you got seven points, you got six points. When you get into real life, you are the one, I should say, you're the one taking full ownership for your, for your, for how you've scored. So it's very important for you to always do regular self-assessments. It's very important for you to always know how you're performing. You know, every year, like it's very important. Or you can do it quarterly as well. You should understand what are, what are the skills I've learned in the last three months? What are the skills I've learned in the last? It's very important for you to know what your skills gaps are to do that regular self-assessment and you invest in resources that would help you to get you where you want to be. You know, the first thing is about goals, about, you know, the next thing is about assessing yourself and then investing in resources that would help you get to where you want to be. Does that make sense? If it makes sense, please type yes in the chat box. Right. So I'm moving on to the last point, which is about getting your hands dirty, you know. So thank you. I can see your responses. Um, so now getting your hands dirty, um, again, just like what you need to do before you get into tech, you need to continue doing that even when you are in tech. You know, you need to make sure that you're always working on real projects. You know, your ideas become any skills you want to be in, in IT, make sure that you're working on real projects related to that. You know, let's say, for example, you want to actually understand DevOps a lot more. There's no point of going to just read the theory of DevOps. Start doing DevOps. Understand how DevOps can be applied in real life. You know, I like this picture so much because it says that, you know, our perception is that the road to success is just very smooth. You know, everything is all good. But the truth is the road to success is very, very, it's something like this. You have to keep, you know, you have to keep encouraging yourself. You have to keep it up. You have to, you know, the road is so rough, you know. And that's why I like the last point I've put here. Becoming an expert in anything takes time. Please pace yourself. <laughs> You know and enjoy the journey but definitely you need to get your hands dirty you need to work on real life projects you need to keep going you need to keep encouraging yourself the thing that is different about real life is that you know you might end up getting a, a tech job that you know all your friends that you guys did you need to get that on that job so you need to have that self-confidence in yourself and you need to be able to you know assess yourself encourage yourself and keep moving forward in the right direction so finally, I'm just going to be showing you some, okay, not finally, but yeah. So these are some useful resources that you can use to build your tech skills that would help you to build a successful career in technology. If you're interested in coding, there's so many free tools out there. 
there's something called Code Academy, mm -hmm. there's tutorials, pointers, LinkedIn learning, all those slides will be sent to you afterwards, okay? So you can see it. There is, um, you know, there's so many things that you can use. There's YouTube, there's Udemy, Stack Overflow, my God. Stack Overflow is one platform that has really saved me. Like, what they do on that platform is that they have lots of, like, random, when you get stuck, you can just raise, I think you raise a ticket or something, and everyone tells you what you need to do to go about it. You know, so that's very useful. It's always good to have that, your virtual, you know, support system, you know, when you're building a tech career. And, of course, if you're interested in cloud, which is what I do, this, this, session is not focused on cloud that's i'm not going to it's more on how to build your successful career in anything you decide to do so you know there there's so many resources that you can use as well finally what are some job roles in technology now a lot of people think tech is all about software development i'm here to tell you it's not all about software development there's so many things that you can do in tech you know and i've just mentioned six of the roles there's so many you know software developers Sorry, I don't need to get caught. I've muted you like three times and you keep unmuting yourself. Please, can you stop that, please? Yeah, yes. thank you. So, right. Um, software. So, the one role is a software developer. These are the guys that actually create applications or systems that run on a computer or another device. So these are the guys that need to really understand Java very well or Python or, you know, all this coding language. You need to understand your coding language very well if you're a software developer. That's what it's mainly about. Like I said, these are the people that will spend a lot of their, you know, time, you know, sitting down, trying to fix bugs, trying to, you know, code, trying to understand how they are going to do this function, this and that. It's a very cool role if it's your person, consider doing it. Now, software testers, these ones are not really like super technical like that. Their own job is to verify whether a product meets the required specifications and customers' expectations. So before you build any software, like there's usually starts from the process where you gather requirements from clients. So the clients, need to, you need to understand what you want the software to do. Let's say, for example, you have a software that, you know, a banking software, you need to be able to check your account balance on your phone, you know, so that's the requirement. So every time the developers have gone through that process to build um, that segment of being able to check your account balance, the testers are the ones that will check, okay, they say you should be able to check your account balance in Naira. You know, does that software, is that software able to tell me my account balance in Naira? If the software is telling me my account balance in dollars, then it's not doing what it was meant to do. So definitely, there's probably a bug somewhere that needs to be fixed. So that's what the software testers do. They just need to understand what the clients require and understand on and be able to like test if that that particular role um, if that particular um, software meets that requirements data scientists they're the ones responsible for you know setting best practices collecting data using analysis tools and interpreting data this is what Okwe is going to be telling you a lot about this. I won't go into details. There's product designers as well. They're the ones responsible for the user experience of a product. Usually they take direction on the business goals and objective from the product manage management team. You know, so the product designer, they're the ones interested in, they're the ones um, involved in user experience. There's also another role called UI, UX, you know, user interface, user experience designer. <laughs> You know, these are the people that would really understand, they would really, their own focus is how the person, the person that is using the software, you know, how they experience it. I don't know if you guys have been to some websites and you're just like, oh my God, I don't even understand what is going on here. You know, everything is just all over the place. Those are so, those are websites that their user experience is really bad or some apps that when you click this, is going into something else. User experience is very bad. So it's the product designer that didn't do their job very well if you see a situation like that. And we have product management as well. Product manager as well. Those are the guys that are responsible for developing products. They manage, they talk to software developers. They, they, they're very people oriented to as well. So if you're that kind of person also not technical but more of like management and you know user experience and things like that and then devops engineer which is which is the final role i'll tell you about which is where i sit you know where the ones that enable continuous develop development and delivery of software Te devops is very is a very technical role in fact what it means is development and operations so we actually like you know we were the ones where the enablers so devops is a very new concept which you know i believe very strong very soon like we'll start practicing i'm, I'm sure there's some companies that do it in nigeria but it's an integration of development which is like the first one we spoke about and operations operations part is the part that has to do with how clients are using it you know the, the the end of the of the software development life cycle so the devops team were the ones that make sure that everything is going smoothly from the beginning where the customers give us their requirements to the end where 
the users are using the software you know we make sure that everything goes smoothly we create a lot of it's very technical you need to understand coding you need to understand so many tools but again there's nothing that you can build up as long as you're persistent with it so um that's all from me thank you so much for listening we'll take questions after our first session at the end but please type your questions in the chat box if you have any uh, so that you don't forget thank you very very much i'll hand over to Okwena. Thank you, Benny. So, I'm sorry, let me share my screen. Okay. Come on. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Sorry, I don't know why it keeps taking me back there. Okay. So, Thank you, Bemi. Thank you, Shayton. They've both spoken a lot about transitioning, how they actually diversify into tech from where they were before and their success story so far. I'm not going to be talking so much about transitioning because I didn't really transition into tech. I was more like on that path already. So today I'll be speaking more on introduction to data science. There were a lot of questions around data science, machine learning, like AI. So I'll be using this opportunity to cover that area as well. So a little bit about myself, I got my bachelor's from mathematics, more like pure math from the University of Ibadan. And after that, I got a master's in mathematical science, where I focused more on math and computer science. This was where I actually got to hear, this was where I knew what big data was all about. This was my first time getting to hear the word Python, like as a programming language, machine learning, all those kind of AI and all. During this, uh, was called, during this my master's, I did my project in financial math. But along the line, I got to partner with a friend who was into machine learning. And when I actually went through some articles, I realized I wanted to go no more. Like I wanted to do more in data science. Like it was kind of interesting for me. I found myself very good at it, like wanting to know more about it. So I told myself, I think I actually decide I need to have another master, like go have another master's in data science. I'm very sure I ended up having the master's in applied math. Right now you'd be thinking I said I wanted to know more in data science, but I ended up having another master's in applied math. So my own work came back to funding. I had to decide if I wanted to go to, if I wanted to be in computer science department or applied math department. But fortunately for me, my department have funding and computer science doesn't have what's it called funding. They only have funding for citizens. So I had to go where the money was, but at the same time still being able to like achieve my goal. Because being in applied mathematics department, I was able to take my compulsory courses from mathematics. I did my required courses in statistics, and I did my what's it called? I took my elective courses from computer science, and these are the three concepts that actually makes up data science. So while I was following the money, I was also following my career goal as well, trying to know more about data science. And after then, I was lucky I got a job with IBM as a data scientist before I moved to my current role right now as a fraud analytic manager. At American Express. I'm also in the US. I love playing volleyball. I love writing and also reading related articles. And also I'm the founder of STEM Girls Initiative. So today I'll be speaking more on data science. I won't go so deep in it, just a little like basic background of data science, some questions we answer with data, what's it called data science, application of data science, and just a little bit. So what is data science? It's Data science with this little chart on the right hand side, that's my own definition of data science. Like having knowledge from computer science, from computer science, having the computer science knowledge, having mathematics and statistics knowledge, and also having some domain knowledge. That's what data science is all about. It's all about using what you don't know, like sorry, using what you know to predict what you don't know, like using historical data to predict the future. Let's say for example, like a company, whether you have signing sheet, like every day when you walk into your office, you need to sign in the time you came in and the time you actually left. So let's say like a year after, like your manager actually wants to know what time you will be in on Monday next uh, next week. It's something your company can actually do by going back to get all your record for the past one year and try to see, try to create a model that we actually build based on what you've been signing in every day. And they can actually use that to predict when you will come in next week. That's data science. Like the way the world is going right now, like you can actually apply data, data science anywhere. And the basic understanding is using historical data to predict the future. That's data science for you. There's so many applications, uh, what's it called, of data science. 
I know I only have six on my slide here, but come to think of it, it's more than that. But I'll be focusing on just these six for today. For the first one, e-commerce, like we have so many examples of what's it called applying data science to e-commerce. Recommending products. For example, the Netflix you see every day. Sometimes when you go on Netflix, Netflix will tell you, oh, based on the movie you saw yesterday, based on the fact that you saw A, I'm going to predict you should see B tomorrow. That's data science. Machine, sorry, manufacturing company as well. You can actually apply data science there. Let's say, for example, your company, you sell cups, you sell plates, you sell spoon, and you realize every day your spoon is, you're always running out of spoon. As a business person, you want to make money and you also want to satisfy your what's it called, your customers. So you need to like come up with what's it called, a plan. That's a, a, that's a problem there. You can actually decide to like come up with a model that will help you to know how many spoons you should have on your chef every day for you to make money or for you to satisfy your customer. That's data science for you as well. Banking, we can apply fraud detection like what I'm doing right now in my current role. Healthcare as well, you can apply. Data science is applicable in healthcare. Transport, all the self-driving driving cars you're seeing around, there's data science in between. Finance as well. When you look at people that actually you give out loan, you can, actually, you can try to predict who is going to defer their loan tomorrow or next month or next tomorrow. Just by having some basic understanding like their income, their employment, the kind of job they have, how many people they have living in their house. and also, like That's how to like, work around data science. Data science is not so difficult that anybody cannot venture into. You just need to have some what's it called, some basic understanding, some programming understanding, and some programming skills as well. I know I've said a lot, like I've mentioned some example of data science, but these are just few I decided to list out. How to predict the likelihood a person would default on a loan, predicting the technological problem occurring, trying to understand the pattern in types of products customers are buying. Let's take for example, like a nursing father who went to start to go buy what's it called diapers. You can see that person going to buy diaper, might actually also buy milk, might decide to buy wipes. Everything was it called the baby uses. But in that kind of situation, you want to like probably put all those things together because you know if he buys diaper, he's going to buy wipes. That's you thinking in the data science world. So this is where I'm going to be focused, you know, focusing on. I've spoken a, a lot about data science, like what it really entails to some extent, the like kind of questions you can solve with data science. But I'm going to be focusing on how we actually carry out the data science pro uh, process. And the reason why I'll be speaking about you know, on this is because there's very there is so much opportunity for anybody to actually do something here. It's not just meant for only data scientists. Depending on what you call your company, depending on how big your company is, your company can a company that actually has so many resources or so many employees can decide to have different specialized role doing some chunk of the project. Why was it called a very small company can decide that all like everything should be done by a data scientist? So on a normal day, like a data scientist is supposed to like understand this whole process and at the same time you can decide to like venture into just one chunk of it. So the first one is business understanding. This is where you want to state the problem. You want to identify the kind of problem you want to solve. You want to know who is going to benefit from it. You want to know why you're solving this problem in the first place. You want to know who are the stakeholders. You want to know the kind of data you use to solve your problem. It can actually be in form of a question or in form of a statement. This is just the business understanding of the whole problem you're solving. Like take one of the examples I've mentioned so far and just see like you're trying to understand the problem, that's all. And the next step is when once you're done, you have a better understanding of what you're trying to solve or what you're trying to deliver to your client. And the next thing you ask yourself is, what kind of data do we need? How do I collect this data? How do I review this data that we actually need? And also, how do I make it in a very good format that I will be needing it like for the next for my next stage? Please, if I'm not if I'm, if I'm too technical for you, just let me know in the chat room. If you think I'm going too fast for you, also let me know in the chat room as well, please. So for the understanding and preparation of the data, the way this actually works is not a big deal. Just like you have a sort of data, you want to make sure everything is a very good format for you to be able to do your modeling. If you have missing data, you want to think about, you want to fill in the gaps so that you don't have some lines empty, why some are what's it called filled with data. So this is where you think of probably doing something like exploratory, exploratory data analysis. If that word is too big for you, what it just means is summary analysis. Like you're trying to get the mean, the mode, the median, the standard deviation of all your rows, just to know how this data vary. Just say, for example, you have an, height was it called you have an eye data like 
something, someone is six feet, someone is five feet. You want to know how this data actually varies for a better understanding of yourself. So this is what you do at this stage. Once you have it in a very good format, in, a, in the format you need it, the next thing you start thinking of is what do I do with this data? How do I make sense of this data? And that's where the modeling stage actually comes in. And this part is where the data scientists actually, that's where the main work of the data scientist or machine learning engineer comes in. Some call it machine learning engineer, some call it, call it data scientist. Depending on the term that is using your, around you or whatever, it's, something, it's just, you can use any of the two. But this is what they do. They try to manipulate the data and try to draw conclusions. This is where you get to use the machine learning techniques you've been hearing about, KNN method, decision tree, just name them. This is where machine learning actually comes in play. And what you're trying to do here, when you actually do one cycle iteration, it's not enough to actually get your accuracy or get your result based on one cycle iteration. You have to keep running your model and keep working on, keep the cycle repeating itself until you have a desired result and you're satisfied that, oh, this result I have is actually answering my business question in the first place. And that actually takes me to evaluation. The evaluation part of it is that you have some part of your, what's it called? You have a chunk of your data. You want to use those little, little part of your data to test your, what's it called, model, just to be sure if, what's it called, if what my model is predicting is good or it's probably just going, it's just giving me 90% because, because of the kind of code I wrote. So you want to be sure whatever you did is actually working to satisfy the business or the code, understanding of the project itself. And the final stage is deployment. Trust me, deployment is not really, really, really important in what's it called, in the data science pro, uh, pro, uh, process. It just depend on the kind of project you're working on. Let's take, for example, the what's it called, Instagram you're using right now, trust me. That's an app. That's when they actually, the developer actually the, the, is the developer that actually does the site. It consists of you trying to integrate the solution into the business to, uh, to actually solve the original pro uh, problem in the first place. The Instagram app you have in your phone, that's a deployment. It was deployed to become an, it was to, to become an app. There was, there was actually a lot of stuff that was done in behind the ground, uh, behind the scene before it became an app on your phone. And that's deployment. I hope I didn't bore you with my technical stuff and how i just wanted to want you to have a better understanding of data science machine learning and how and my next slide is basically talking about specialized role in data science process like i said before the previous was a process i went through with you it can be done you can have so many specialized roles working on it uh, was called each chunk of it and a data scientist can be asked to do everything for the first part which is understanding the business problem that's ma mainly done by a business analyst and these business analysts people, they don't need to like know more coding. If you know coding is not your strength, trust me. You don't want to go too deep into all these technical roles. Just know what works for you, like Shaitan and Demi said already. If you think like you're not so good with coding, business analysis is actually a good role for you. All you need to have is a very good domain understanding of, of your area. And also the tools they use, just Excel. Some of them use SQL just to like have a better understanding of the kind of data they will be giving to their data engineer. And for the understanding and preparing of the data part of it, it's mostly done by data engineer. And if they have a very big data, like then when it comes to big data projects, they can use Adobe, Spark, you can even use Python as well to clean your data and do anything you want to do with it. And the main work part of it, which is the modeling part of the modeling of the data itself, that's done by data scientists or machine learning engineer, like I said already. And one of the common open source tools people use today is Python. And it has a lot of related packages like scikit-learn for machine learning for you to incorporate machine learning into it. You can use R as well. And if it's a very big data, you can use Py, PySpark. And the last part, which is the deployment, is mostly by, done by developer. These are people that actually do the main work, the main coding, just like what was it called, what Bimi does, they try to like deploy this model into a, what's it called, an app, or depending if it's a web, it's a web app or so. So this is just a little part of what's it called, like data science, what, you, what kind of question you answer with data science, what, when, how do you know if it's a data science question, when you, when you actually have a data to solve, your, to solve your problem statement, then you're looking at a data science problem. It, like it, there's so much data science, like it's a very broad, a very, very broad area whereby machine learning comes into it. But during the question and answer, I'm going to speak more on data science and machine learning in a very, what's it called, layman language. 
And now what next? My colleagues, have, they've already told you, you need to like take some time, understand your strengths and weaknesses. Know where you're good at. Am I good at coding? Is, am I kind of person I don't even like coding at all? Just know where, know your strengths. Know where you, where you actually fit in, like properly. And after then, once you know what you actually want to do, have some clear, short and long term goal. Like Jayton said, in the next three months, I want to make sure I'm done with this Python course. And every day I have to take two hours of my time, try to learn this and that. It's just very basic. Don't, tr don't try to do ITK or I2 know also. Just take it bit by bit. It's better than trying to load everything to yourself every day. Like just, oh, I need to get that job quickly. So it's not all about getting the job quickly. It's about how efficient you are. That's what the recruiters actually want to see in you. Also, if you think like, what's it called? The knowledge I have right now is not enough. Can decide to pursue what's it called advanced degree. That's what works for me. It might not work for you, like Shayton said. And if you think you already was it called, you already have a master's, you're good to some extent, all you need is some polishing and all, you can decide to do professional certification and uh, professional courses. In the required skill set, you need to be successful in your career. And also, like like we all everybody have been saying so far, seek out for a mentor. They said two years are better than one. And at the same time, you also want to have someone out there that is looking out for you. So it's good to have a mentor. I also have a mentor. The way, I, the way I'm trying to mentor some people, I also have a mentor because I can't do it on my own. I still need people to guide me around. And lastly, put yourself out there. I mean, put yourself out there in such a way that you have some platform, you're using GitHub. Anytime you work on a very small project, you try to put it somewhere. So that by the time you're looking for this job, the recruiters are there for you. They can actually see the kind of work you've been working on. They can actually see the kind of project you've been working on. They can see you've been trying something. It doesn't have to be a very big project. See, what we do every day, there's so many work, there's so many projects to come out from everything we do every day. So don't think you need to like solve the whole world problem before you actually get better. And these are some resources, like we are going to be sharing the slide with you at the end of the old section. These are books. I make I'm the kind of person I love reading art books. I hate soft copies. Like I, I sleep off when I'm reading from the laptop. So I'm, I have all these books with me. I've read them and they've been very useful to me. And it's, actually, it's also good for beginners as well as what's it called? Expert as well. You can actually go through all of them. Like take your time, spend some money, buy some book, buy some ebooks and get yourself better. And on the other side is the online platform. My, like my colleagues have said a lot about online platform. So I don't even have to go into it so much because Sarah is there, Udem is there, Pia Course is there, Code Academy is there. I'm just going to like end the whole session with this few point. Please know what you want to do. Let's start with that. Know your passion. It comes with passion as well, and it comes with your strengths. It takes, that's where you need to start from. Once you are so satisfied with what you want to do, you know, you're so sure, it can't be clear. Trust me, your five year goes from now. I don't even, I cannot even tell you I have a five year go from now. I can tell you I have this, I have that, but they're all blurry. Your goal doesn't need to be so perfect right now. Just start from somewhere. That's all I'm going to tell you. Thank you. And for mentorship opportunity, this is our, what's it called, link so far. Like we are taking, we are currently having a, what's it called, a waiting list for next year cohort members. So if you want to join our mentorship section, our program, send us an email and also try to follow us out there. So right now, I'm sorry, I don't know if I bore you guys so much with my technical stuff, but I'm just trying to let you know there's so much, there's so much more to what's it called data science out there. So use the chat room to ask questions. Right now, I'll be going more into questions on the call. Kaya is going to be taking us through some of the questions we have so far before we go to the pre asked questions. I hope you guys were clear, please, to some extent. Yeah. Tayo, do you have some questions for us so far? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is from Ethel, and it said, like you said, tech is the future and future is here, particularly the training artificial intelligence. Before I went for NYC, I picked a course with a tech company in Port Harcourt where I learned a bit more than basics in app development and robotics. During my NYSE, it's been quite te tedious and I am looking forward to going back once I pass out in June. I studied petroleum and gas engineering and the oil industry is very volatile. That's one of the reasons why I made this leap of faith. How do I make this 
that transition, even though I'm positive about working in the energy sector? Do you want me to rephrase the question? I think it's clear. I think it's clear. I don't mind answering. Is that, is that okay? That's okay. fine. Okay. So now, like, you have petroleum engineering knowledge and you have um, technology, software development. That's a very good combo to have. I don't think you necessarily need to, like, completely drift from one to another. I actually have a friend here in the UK who is a petroleum engineer. And the nature of her work right now, she's having to do a lot of Python programming and a lot of data science. She's working in BP in the UK. So, and she also studied in Nigeria as well. So there is, these days, there's beginning to be a lot of intersection between engineering and coding. So I would say that hone your skills, like keep doing your coding. If you're enjoying it, if it's something you love, keep doing it and look at where the opportunities will come. If eventually you get an oil and gas job, like there's still so many applications that you can still integrate your tech knowledge into oil and gas. And if you get a tech job, you can still continue focusing on tech and your knowledge of engineering just makes you see things differently. So I'll say that keep building both skills. Like I don't think you should at this point think of transitioning from one place to another. You can either end up combining, you can end up leaving one for the other and integrating the other a little. So that's what I would advise you. Thank you. So this is from the same person that asked the first question. I have also leveraged on some online courses this past month. However, we, we all know that data is quite expensive in Nigeria. I recently saw an opportunity on Udacity and I hope that's right, and really want to forge ahead. However, I am having a tough time in choosing between artificial intelligence, coding, ETC. These things are confusing me, and I want to request that more light be thrown on coding, developing, etc. Mm, I'm actually going to be shedding more light on what's it called, kind of skills a developer actually need, and the difference between data science and machine learning in the previous question. If that's fine. Okay. Thank or you. I can actually go over it now, or and we neglect it later. That which one is fine, but okay, fine. Let me just go into it. So th these are some skills. What's it called for a developer? You need to what's it called? See, it's not about you knowing coding and coding. Of course, that's one key part of it. But it starts with what's it called? Patience and curiosity. You need to be very patient as a developer. You need to be very patient because you get you will actually get stuck in a lot of code. Like in a code, you can actually work on a code for one week, one month, and get stuck on it. So you need to be very patient. You need to have some what's it called be perseverant also you need to like have the what's it called the soft skill which is the language itself choose your language python java which one do you want to be so good at javascript key to it like know more about it and all also you need a what's it called logic and abstract thinking understanding you need to know how to think abstractly it's not all about like one plus one there's more to one plus one you, can, you need to think widely think beyond your what's it called beyond your own normal understanding also, you need to have attention to like have some attention to details because that like the what's it called? If you're working on a code and you feel like oh you're working in the for for a whole day, you may actually actually it may, it may actually be because of one mistake. Maybe you actually you didn't put a what's it called syntax error. So you need to have a what's it called put some attention to details. And for the difference between machine learning, data science, AI, they are all what's it called? It's a big word. So without going so much trying to go so much into it. I will try a very simple answer in a layman language that anyone can actually use as a starting point when you're looking for a definition. Machine learning is contained, contained inside data science. And every time a machine learning algorithm is used, you're doing data science, that's it. This is very easy to explain. Machine learning algorithm, they learn from data. Though you, as they're also doing, data, what's it called? Though you are doing data science, that's automatic. You can do data science without machine learning because data science is very broad, like statistical inference, that's when you don't need machine learning. Data collection, data cleaning, data visualization, information retrieval, variation analysis. They are all you doing data science without using machine learning. So finally, I would say that data science is anything that tries to answer a question using data, like I said before. And machine learning is one of the ways to do it. And artificial intelligence on its own, it's just like capping, what's it called? It's like the broad father of the, the old tool that I just mentioned. That's all. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from Modupe. And Modupe wants three speakers to answer a question. 
So, Mojo question is, thank you, Sheiton and Bemi. Okay, so my question really is, I keep wondering, Sheiton works in Microsoft and Bemi works in Essential UK. How did you get the job? Was this connection thing, LOL in bracket, or you applied online or because you were abroad doing your master's, so it was quite easy to go to the company? Just wondering though, please share how. Let me start. Um, for me, can you all hear me, Kali? Sure. Yes. All right. So for me, I think it's a combination of the three. Um, when I was doing my job search, of course, I went to a lot of companies and dropped my resume. That you have to apply for. I have to. Apply. Me. But getting my job in Microsoft, and I know Microsoft also have, um, recruits across the world, especially in Africa. So even if you're in Nigeria, they can. They do a lot of applications in schools. I know the the highest number is usually Unilag or maybe Unibado. But they do apply. For me, it was more of I had someone who referred me. And fortunately, because not all referrals actually go through, fortunately, I was selected and I went through like six or five, six to five interview stages and then got selected. So I want to say I think it's a combination of everything. You need to know the right people that can refer you, that trust you and believe in your skills enough to refer you. And also be prepared during the interview process because it's one thing to refer you, but you also need to display your skills to the recruiters during the interview. And yes, maybe because I'm also here, we already had some of the visa requirements, right? But I do know for a fact that Microsoft does recruit in Nigeria, does recruit across Africa. They go to universities and recruit top talents. So just look out for that. And I mean, as part of SGI as well, if we have those information, we'll definitely thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shaito. Yeah, I think my story is slightly similar to that as well yes yeah, so um yeah a combination of many of it so first yes there was a referral as well of which most times so in countries in the western world most times they like referrals because they don't just want to like hire a random person that nobody can vouch for so someone in the company being able to refer you matters a lot but that's just to give you like one percent i don't even know how to explain it but that's just to give you a foot in the door because it's so opposite to what happens in Nigeria that if you because you know somebody, your chance is 99%, then your skills now one percent. That's the way it's in Nigeria. Here it's the other way around. You know, they refer you probably like five percent, but you need to be able to prove yourself. So again, my interview process was um my interview process was also very rigorous. There was a lot of being able to prove to them that you know I could do the job. I could, you know, I did technical interview, I did HR interview, I did all of that process as well. And, it, and again, yes, I did my master's in UK, but for me, I wasn't, I didn't have, because I don't have British passport, I was born and bred in Nigeria. So my company actually had to file for me to be able to stay and work in the UK. And again, that only happened, yes, there was the grace of God, because I'm a Christian, I'm a firm believer of God's grace. There was the grace of God, but there was also that aspect of, they were, already, they already saw my track record, like my results in school were good. I had done a few IT projects on my own and I was able to defend my projects so that that was you know part of it and the company actually was able to you know work out my documents for me to be able to legally stay in the UK and work in the UK again like Shaitan said I know I have a lot of friends here that they recruited from Nigeria companies like Goldman Sachs in the UK they recruit directly from Nigeria they come to UI they do all sorts of assessments I have two close friends that are in the UK that are from nigeria directly without doing a master's here without knowing anyone even so it's very important for you to actually focus on making sure that you're very good at what you do like that's what i'll tell you to focus on actually if you are doing abroad i don't know how it works on nigeria i didn't really have a lot of connections in nigeria and possibly why i didn't really get a job in nigeria but i know that in the western world your skills is what really speaks for you we don't really know a lot of people and another advantage that you guys have let me just add this finally is that see these days a lot of companies are looking for black women black people then they're looking for black women who are really niche so if you're a black woman in nigeria you are very good like a recruiter reached out to me on linkedin recently i was like oh they are looking for a black woman that is a devops engineer oh can i come and join blah 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 they wanted to do an interview for me so the fact that i'm even a black woman it already even gives an advantage so if you're very good understand that you're niche because you're black and a lot of big companies are trying to improve their diversity so make sure they are very good at what you do put yourself out there reach out to recruiters on linkedin and continue being good so yeah that's what i would say so from my own side 
I'm actually going to be speaking more on my own first, what's it called, job experience. Because I would say the experience I had from my first one was actually helped me to get a second job. But for my first job with IBM, I will tell you, when I got that job, like I, I, I got my job, I got a job with IBM in my first semester, just my first semester of getting to the US. And I personally knew I wasn't going to be allowed to go for that, what's it called, internship. Because there's a rule here that you must have spent two semesters as an international student before you can actually go out to go do internship. But I still went for that conference because I wanted to network with people. I wanted to know what this was called, how this conference actually works, what people go there to do. I mean, when I say conference, I mean career fair. Places you like, you go for conference, you go, go look for a job. I just wanted to know more about the whole setting itself. So it wasn't so much about me getting the job in the first place because I knew. I knew even if I get a job there, I won't be allowed to go. So there was no point for me going in the first place. But I still went because I wanted to like, I would like be open to what is happening there because I know when I'm ready, I want to be ready, like fully ready. So I went there mostly for connection, like networking, meeting recruiters, like network was it called other students and all. And I was so lucky. I just went to I just went to IBM Boot and I spoke with them and I talked about my project, what I've worked on before because I've done some machine learning project on my own. Sorry, and for my what's it called my previous master's project and i spoke to them the recruiter was very very was it called interested in me and took me to the back we had a series of interview after then like i had a series of interview and i got the internship and after getting the internship they tried their best to get me in even though i knew i wasn't going to go i just want like i, I just put myself out there at the long run i couldn't go for the internship and during the was it called when the summer was almost over one of the recruiter reached out to me that am i still am i interested in full-time position with them I was very happy. Like I just felt like, oh, this actually paid off. My going there to put myself out there actually paid off. And I did a series of interviews after that, like then gave me a shade and said, like almost five interviews after then. And I got a full-time job in my second semester. So it all goes back to number one, knowing what you want. Number two, having the required soft skills needed for that kind of job. And also number three, trying to put yourself there. Networking, make use of LinkedIn. Even if they don't what it called, they don't reach out to you, reach out to them. There are recruiters everywhere. The kind of recruiters on LinkedIn that are actually looking for people. All you have to do is have a what's it called, a very good understanding with them. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, trust me, I will advise you to go open up one. And also one thing I will advise you if you're trying to go into the technical world, all these small small projects you're doing, create a GitHub account. It's called GitHub. I'm going to put it on the chat room. Create a GitHub account and try to put every simple project you do. Just try to put it there. So that by the time you're ready for this job and you have a room, you have a repository where you have all your projects you've done, you can actually defend your project. It's not like you tell uh, you tell your recruiter, I did this project, I did this project, but you don't have anything like to back it up. So try to put yourself out there like everybody I've said, and also network. Thank you, everyone. So the next question is from Michael. Michael wants to know what's really the difference between Dev and DevOps? I think that's what gave me, I think. Yes, mm -hmm. that's fine. Dev is all about software development. All, like we've said earlier, like these are people that use a language, Java, Python, blah, 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 to write lines of code that solve a problem. So let you have an app. I usually like banking app because, I mean, it's, it's, it's what everyone can relate with. You have your first bank app on your phone that tells you your account balance or it tells you um, you can use it to make payments. You can use it to do all that. All that that full app came together as a result of a software developer using a particular programming language to write lines of code and telling the software that, oh, you know, when when Michael clicks this button, you know, bring out when Michael types the account number, show the person's name. When Michael puts ten thousand naira for transfer and he press send send the account number send the amount to a particular account so that's developer a developer is the one that just writes the code giving instructions of what a software should do devops is about integrating development and operations and what that means is that we work across the entire software development life cycle even i'm telling you a developer writes the line of code and then you have your app on your phone there is a lot that goes on into that so there is a part of requirements gathering there is the design phase. There is a phase where the software developer builds. There's a place where the testers test the code. There's a phase where the code is deployed into the client side, into the, you know, into where it needs to be used and the code is monitored and there's feedback and all of that. So there are about six stages in software development lifecycle. A DevOps engineer makes sure that those six stages work 
you know, seamlessly and you're, you're able to do that rapidly. So when any company that is enabling DevOps, like is an agile way of working. So, you know, as they are developing code, as a new requirement is coming in, you're building it, you're testing it, you're deploying it, you're getting feedback from customers. You're able to do that rapidly and go in a loop. That's what DevOps is all about. So, and for, for the software developers to be able to do that, there are so many tools. There needs to be something you call a software, a, um, a, an SCM, I mean, um, there has to be version control. There has to be a, a repository like GitHub that I was talking about where every developer puts their code. Everyone needs to integrate the code. There are so many tools that you use in DevOps. It's, I don't want to go too technical, but that's the overview. I hope that makes sense. So we enable the entire software developer cycle to go smoothly and to go rapidly and as frequently as possible. So we're able to respond fast to change. Even when the requirement changes, you know, you're able to go through that cycle again and quickly deploy that application and quickly, you know, make that change to the application without without anything breaking in the process. Yeah, um, that's where I'll stop for now because if I go too deep, it might be too much. But let me know if you understand that, Michael. Yeah. That's all. Tyra, what's the next question? I think we'll just have a break now. Or oh, okay, you want to, want us to add the questions later, right? So we'll actually go to what's it called the pre-asked questions, the ones you guys already have, like the questions you guys submitted during your application. We're able to come up with some of them that were actually crucial to the presentation itself. So we'll be going through this, then we'll come back to the on chat question. So keep using the chat room to ask a question. And if you are if we are here to get to your question, don't worry, we'll be there. We'll be back there. This one won't take so much time. We'll be back to your questions. So keep using the chat room. So now to the previous question. Bemi, um, I said Bemi, Tayo. Okay. The very first question is can someone with no background venture into tech? Um, so for that, let me take that because, of course, I had absolutely no background in tech. I started off, like I said before, as an art student. So yes, you can you can venture into technology with absolutely no background. What you need to do, however, like we already said, is ensure that you have you have identified what you want to pursue, meaning by identifying your strength, by identifying a problem you want to fix. It might not be a problem for you, whatever it is for you, identify that build your skills, leverage all of these tools, all of these various resources available online, and build your skills, work on projects, keep building. The person that is not, for me again, I didn't have a background in tech, so the level at which I would study and practice would be different from the level at which someone who is already in tech will do. So if you're not already in tech, make sure you're putting extra efforts into things, but definitely, short answer, yes, Someone with no background in tech can definitely venture. Thank you, Shaito. Second question, how can I leverage my current skill set in the tech world? Um, uh, oh, sorry. Well, I think to a large extent, um, I'll just answer this briefly. To a large extent, there is no, none of your skill is wasted. Whether you are currently in business or you are in technology, whatever it is you are in, all of your skills will be relevant. And the good thing is, as a technologist or as someone in technology who has always been in technology, the problem, not the problem, but the thing with that with that is a lot of the time you're able to you're unable to see a different perspective to things. But when you're coming from a different background, it helps you have empathy, it helps you balance things. I don't know if you guys have heard of STEAM. So beyond STEM, there's something called STEAM where there's the art in between. Now that's where everything balances together. Art Technology, business, everything is relevant together to make one whole body that makes our world better, if that makes sense. So I'll play me to go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, I'll, for you to be able to leverage your current skill set, my own, was it called, from my own point of view, I'm going to say, be sure your current skills are needed for your chosen career. Because the world we have right now, everybody's learning everything. You see yourself learning Python, you see yourself learning digital thinking like you just keep learning everything just because that's what everybody is going into but if you have a goal you have a career goal like just make sure whatever current skills you have right now are needed for your chosen career but if it's if what you have right now is not needed try to like know what you need for your what's it called your next step and try to like acquire the soft skills thank you the third question how to acquire tech or programming skills 
we i will check that one we've said a lot about that on the oh was a call presentation there was a call there are rooms are out there like code like coursera code academy udemy these are places where you can learn what's it called all these kind of skills like python r java no matter what skills you want to learn even beyond that leverage all this was it called leverage all this was all this online platform and try to get the skills you want to get and if you don't if you're a kind of person you don't like online learning or so there are also i'm sure there are what's it called physical there are physical training centers around you that you can actually learn all this from as well so how to acquire, acquire programming skills be ready for it like know that you have at, your attention to details you have like you logic and thinking uh, abstract thinking is there you, you are patient you are curious to learn as well then once you have all those all those personal skills then you can actually go on and leverage all this was all this online training and all this online platform and you get to learn whatever skills you want to learn Thank you. And the fourth question, how to choose the right niche in tech in relation to our course of study? Well, I can take that. Um, and I think I already covered this before. For me, it was more of, I studied banking and finance. I had worked in the banking industry. I had identified a problem in the banking industry. I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to do this in science. But I had a mentor who could guide me through that. I had, I had done research on, okay, this is what I want to do. What's the trending courses or what's the trending programs or courses for me to pursue that can actually merge banking and finance or being a financial data analyst? What courses can I do and help me achieve that goal? And that was how I was able to pick it. So, for example, you're in agriculture. I know someone asked the question about, I studied agriculture um, education, diversifying to tech. Yes, there are lots of people doing stuff with, for example, data science in agri. Look at this. People analyze the soil. Like it can be that simple. People look at the soil and say, oh, this is what kind of plants grow in this soil. This is what kind of plants grow in that soil. This is what season or whatever happens in each season. Collect all of that data and analyze it. It's that simple. So identify what you're really passionate about identify your course of study or whatever your course of study is and try and merge it together find a common path or a common thing that aligns to both of them and go with that i hope that helps okay thank you Shaito. the fifth question is how to harness opportunities okay i can take that one how to harness opportunities I would say be open-minded. Like I remember when I was in the UK, I was so keen on mechanical engineering role. You know, I did not understand the beauty of technology. Although I'd done some personal tech projects, I just didn't know that it could be it could be an option for me to do a career in it. You know, so be very very open-minded and be ready to explore. Have confidence. Have a mindset of lifelong learning because let's say for example an opportunity comes and you feel you're not prepared for it. You know, if you're somebody that has a mindset of lifelong learning, you can always tell people that you can learn on the job. See, even within Accenture, one thing that has helped me, my line, my tagline, if I can put it that way in, in the company, is when they give me a work to do, I'll be like, I don't know this, but I can learn. I don't know. I've never heard of this, but I can learn. I've never heard of this. And you also have to, you know, it's always very good to get mentors as well to, you know, to guide you in the right direction. And when you promise them that you can learn this, deliver as well so your confidence is very important your openness to opportunity is very important your mindset of being a lifelong learner is very important because let me tell you there's absolutely nothing you cannot learn as long as you're interested so that's how you take advantage of opportunities most times opportunities that come your way are things that you're not prepared for but if you have a mindset of lifelong learning and you let them know that see this is not my area of strength but i can learn so they already know that you're not coming as it's not like you're lying about your skills you already told them you don't know so they would help you as well as you go and develop so that's what i would say in answer to okay, that. let me just add to that quickly um, like Bimi already said, you need to have a growth mindset. So you need to be open to learning anything and wherever and anyhow. But another thing is never say no. When you see that it's an opportunity, when you're in your place of work, at school, wherever it is, if they say, can you do this? Yes. Don't ever say no. The thing is, as you grow, they find, and again, don't just say yes and then do a mediocre job. 
say yes, research all that you need to do and put the best efforts in it. As you keep growing, as you keep going ahead in your career, people will start trusting you. People will start putting stuff in your hands. People will start giving you things to do. And that is how you build a reputation of excellence. That is how people start recognizing you in top positions and things like that. So never say no to any opportunity. There is no opportunity that is useless. Thank you. Thank you, Shaito. Um, the sixth question is how to start making impact as a student. Okay, I can take that one as well. How to start making impact? We've kind of spoken about it. You know, start working on projects, on personal projects. The first tech project I worked on was related to just like Shaitan, I did a banking, you know, project. Was something related to cake. You know, I used to bake in Nigeria, and I just thought about the what's the point of calculating ingredients every single time? If I want to bake a chocolate cake, I'll cal I'll start calculating the ingredients because the one I have is for twelve inches, and I want to bake a twenty inches cake. I would have to, you know, be doing the calculation over and over again, and I was just like i can actually automate this whole thing i can create then it was excel i knew i was like i can create an excel sheet to you know to to help me solve this problem so i remember i did that excel. i did colons for like eggs and you know flour quantities and all of that so i developed in such a way that the only thing i would say is chocolate cake 12 inches and it gives me all the ingredients i need to use fruit cake eight inches it gives me all the that was actually my first secret and i found it really cool later i used python to solve that same problem but it started from what i knew and what i was interested in so how can you start making impact as a student they've talked about github start practicing think about any project any um problem that you think you can solve it can be very little see why this was not cake you know just baking ingredients that you need that can be used to solve a lot of problems so get involved in personal projects about resources that you can use as well get involved in extracurricular activities oh my god i keep seeing ui students you guys do so much boot camps there is so much going on in in, in universities in nigeria these days all those things we didn't even have it you guys have robotics clubs you have so many cool things get involved don't just do academics get involved in extracurricular stuff lead positions do all those things and then also make sure your profile is on point make sure as you're doing these things your profile is updated for you Doing. you're highlighting the skills that you're gaining from all the things that you're doing you're highlighting the projects you're working on how good you are that's what i think you should start doing as a student thank you and the next question is how to start tech at the beginner and grow tech knowledge we talked about that you know resources identify what you want have clarity make use of online resources and if you like hard copy books use hard copy books as well so yeah and be passionate be interested it's very important don't just do tech for the money be interested be passionate about it you know and choose an area that interests you can you put yourself on mute bim bim Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, are we good? Are we yeah. Good? Yeah. Okay. So the next question is I think we answered this already though, but how to sync other fields with tech? Yeah, I can take that one too. See, let me tell you, these days, almost every field can be integrated into tech. First, I would say you can also even Google it. As a medical doctor, how can I apply technology? I mean, my younger sister is a medical student and I keep telling her, you know, cause she's kind of interested in tech. You know, I keep telling her, um, you know, um, what's, what's, you know, check online to see what people are doing related to tech, you know, what are they doing related to tech, think about it. So there's so many resources online for you to say, for you to see what people in your field are doing in tech. I, I just spoke about a petroleum engineer as well, who is now using Python, who is developing, you know, so it's very important for you to check online to see what people are doing, you know, as a banker, how can I integrate technology? And I will say expand your creativity as well. Maybe you are going to be the first person to bring tech into your industry. As you learn how to code, as you learn how to code, and continue your field you can begin to see some links you can begin to see some integrations you can begin to see some solutions you can begin to see things that are unique that's one thing i love about technology you can actually start you can actually champion things without 
without it being done before by the time it's, you keep learning so check online to see what people are doing you know check for what people are doing if people in your field check what they're doing how they're applying technology and also like expand your creativity as you are learning how to code expand your creativity and think outside the box think about the kind of solutions that you can come up with that are unique to your area so that's my answer for that Okay. The next question is more views about data science and machine learning. Yeah, I won't say so much. I'm just going to try to give you the difference between AI, ML, and data science. Artificial intelligence, actually, it combines large amounts of data through iterative process and using intelligent what's it called algorithms to help computers to learn automatically, which is kind of similar to machine learning. But what, what is different is that machine learning uses efficient programs. They use so many techniques that can use that can be you know, that can actually use data to self-learn without having to like instruct the program, this is what to do. Why data science on its own? It works by you sourcing for data, cleaning the data, processing the data to try to extract meaningful insight out of it by analysis, uh, sorry, by true analytical purpose, uh, for analytical purpose. And I'll give you just three examples, like just to differentiate between AI, ML, data science. All this chat box, like anytime you go, maybe I don't know, I think Access Bank in Nigeria, you can actually speak to what's called a live chat box from what they call from their website. You can ask social questions and they'll keep answering. Those are chat bots. And that's an example of artificial intelligence. For machine learning, this recommend uh, recommendation system, the way Netflix actually helps you to recommend a movie, that's machine learning. And for data science, when you're talking about analytics, like healthcare analysis, like fraud and risk detection, that's data science. I mean, they all, I'm, I'm sure everything all sometimes, they all come together that you think like, oh, I'm working on machine learning. No, no, you're working, actually working on data science. Like I said already, you cannot actually, machine learning is one way of doing data science. Why AI is just like the father of all of, all of them? I don't need to answer your question. Next slide, I guess. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm going to out now. Let me help. Uh, we already answered the first question, which is resources that can help a student without a tech, tech background on how to get into tech. We already covered that piece. Um, so let's skip to the next one. What are the skills needed for a business analyst or a data scientist? Um, if you go through my slide, you actually get that as well. Like all the skills that like you actually need to build on, they are, they are in my slide as well. Um, skills needed to diversify. I think we already covered that. Sense, but is there anyone that wants to cover that as well again? Nah, nah. All right. Um, number four. What are some soft skills needed in the twenty-first century? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, let me cover that quickly. Some soft skills needed in the 21st century. We already, if you go through my slide, we already have a couple of those. But soft skills, number one, relationship building. Like someone had asked the question about how did we get our jobs? Before we got those jobs, we had to know someone, right? Who was able and willing to vouch for us to refer us. So for you, you need to build relationships with people and be willing to be willing to humble yourself and seek for help right so number one humility number two um relationship building number three you don't have to be an excellent communicator but be able to communicate what you want and what you need and what you're trying to say um i think those are three very important things i mean in my experience so far those are three important things that i think would take you to to great places really okay sorry i was on mute i was literally talking to myself so the next question is tech suggestions to dive into for beginners well let me say something to that like what 
tech suggestions for beginners, I would actually say, like I said before, depending on how passionate you are about coding, not all was it called tech, actual tech career actually need coding, like Bimi said, like she mentioned. There's product manager, there's program manager, all these people, they don't do much of bunch of Python coding and writing coding or everything. You can actually venture into that if you know you are not, like you don't have passion for coding. And also you can think of business analyst. Business analyst is actually a very lucrative, like people are getting to know more about it. And there's, it's even getting, like it's getting a little bit technical than it used to be before, but still they don't do more, more, more of coding as well. And you can also go into data science, data analytics. There's no, so like, I mean, there's coding in data science, but it's more like a repetitive work. Like once you know how to train a data, once you know how to test a model, so train a model, uh, test a model, know what to do, you are good. You can always apply it to other fields and run the same code. No, run something similar, do something similar to answer another what's it called problem statement. Those are some, I'm, I will tell you some of the what's it called tech suggestions that I will actually give you as a beginner who doesn't really have any coding experience and all. Maybe anybody can add to that. And I'm sure Bimi has mentioned a lot already in the slide as well. Are we good? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to add something, Bimi? No, no, nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So the next question is, the right way to go into tech and still practice your desired course, especially if you, especially if your course is high demanding and not tech related. I can take that one. Okay, so I think this is similar to the question that somebody had earlier as well. Like, I wouldn't say that you should leave your course, especially if it's in high demand and it's not tech related. You know, if you're interested in tech, what I would say is that, and you really love your job, right? What I would say is that find an intersection between the two. Like I said, see, the world is becoming very technical. The only reason why we're doing this call today is because there's technology in place. I don't believe that there's no field that you can't find, um, you know, a link between technology and that field. In fact, being able to add a layer of technology to any field right now, that's the future. That's the future of everything. So I would say that still keep doing your desired course. Especially if you're in uni, please focus on your education and finish with the best, best grade that you can. If your course is high demanding, keep doing it, you know. But what I can say is you don't need to make a U-turn completely. You can have an intersection. You can, as you're learning how to code, you can begin to think about how you can solve some problems in your field with software because every field has that. That's my advice for you. Thank you, Bemi. Anybody adding anything to that? Um, Are we good? No, yeah. we're good from my side. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, what exactly is the difference between technology and engineering? Are they intertwined? So in the context of, I can take that one, in the context of um, technology that we've been referring to today has been mainly about information technology and information tech. So I'll kind of clarify the three, right? IT, tech, um, engineering. Information technology is mainly about software, right? You're talking about how you de develop, maintain, how you, you know, build computer networks, all those things are related to, you know, software development and building an IT system. That's what information technology is all about. When we talk about technology in itself, technology in itself is really about getting things done, is how you make things happen. So an engineering is the process you go through before you start making things happen. And what I mean by that, in engineering, mechanical engineering, for example, has to do with the design. So that's about, like, before you even have something tangible working, you know, you're already, engineering has to do with designing it, you know, you're already designing it. You're thinking about what materials can I use to make this happen? Say you want to build a nail cutter, for example. You know, you're thinking, what's this nail cutter going to do? What am I going to use? You know, what material is going to be steel? Is it going to be aluminum? You're thinking about how are the components of that nail cutter going to work together? You're thinking about all of those things you know, in engineering. So that's engineering. You're engineering a solution. You're thinking about a solution. Technology is how that solution is going to come into play. So are we going to use um, molding to do it? Are we going to use um, casting? Are we going to use the blast furnace? Are we going to use how you get your engineering solution to actually work in real life is the technology that you're using. 
you know, right? So that's the difference between engineering and technology. Engineering is you're thinking about the solution. You're planning how you're going to do it. You're thinking of the materials you're going to use. You're thinking about how the components are going to work together. You're thinking about the heat transfer, all of those cool things. That's the engineering bit. But the technology is how you're going to get that thing working. You know, after I think of those things, how am I going to get the aluminum to actually melt to a particular degree? The technology I'm going to use is going to be die casting, for example. The technology I'm going to use is going to be furnace. The technology I'm going to use is going to be this. You know, but in the context that we're talking about technology today is more of IT, information technology. And what that has to do is, you know, how you develop, maintain computer systems, you know, how information flows, how you build software, how you, how you, how infrastructure, software infrastructure works together, how you do networking, how you process data, machine learning, all of those things are related to information technology. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And the next question is, what qualities do you think are most important for a developer or programmer? I've said this before, I'm just going to repeat myself. Again. Perseverance, like Avi was it called, be patient and curious. Avi was it called, the programming language itself, skills is needed. Logic and abstract thinking is very, very needed as well. And at the same time, try to have a GitHub account as, an, as a developer, a software developer, as a software programmer. You need to have a what's it called a GitHub account where you can actually put your code or you put your projects. Recruiters actually love to see all these when they are recruiting for jobs. Another very, very, very important thing is attention to detail. Yeah, attention to detail. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot that you need to be able to support and you know fix as you're going. So attention to detail is very important. Okay, thank you. And the last question on this slide is what to expect in the tech world as mm -hmm. females? Okay, I can take that one. Now, regarding this kind of questions, you know, what to expect in tech world as females? It varies, but one thing remains constant. The focus for you, male or female, most times I don't like to really have any pity party about being a woman. I just like to get the job done, right? What, what to expect varies. But if I can tell you what to, you know, how to position your mind I don't think you should be worried about the fact that you're female, you're male. Your focus is actually to be very, very good at what you do. When you're very good at what you do, what I've noticed is that people don't care about your gender. They just want someone that is going to get the job done. So nobody is saying that, oh, imagine, especially in the business world, in uni, people can be very, oh, in fact, I remember when I was in uni, I remember one guy once said it to myself and told me, I think she's on the call, we're the only two girls in mechanical engineering. And I think he once said it that, oh, me le jeko biri, inshallah, eh, come for me. You know, people now that's how you're about, like, as a guy, he said, I don't like why I explained it to him. I'm like, this one is not ready to learn, you know? So, and obviously, I don't know what he does with his female lecturers. So my point is, it doesn't really matter whether you're male or female, your, your, your focus is actually to be very good at what you do. So in the business world, nobody has those sentiments because at the end of the day, the company wants to make profit and it's whoever is able to get the job done that they're going to put in the role. So whether you're male, whether you're female, if you're good, you will get the job. And what to expect, for me as a DevOps engineer, I'll be very honest with you. And in my company, as much as we're very diverse, not so many women are interested in being like super technical, which is the reason why we're doing things like this. Being technical is not difficult and we want a lot more women to do it so that we can support ourselves in the tech world. You know, sometimes it can be isolating for me. Sometimes I just want to talk to a lady at work, you know, but it's male dominated in my field. It's not the same for Shaitan or for her, And I expect that they would answer the question too as well, you know, but for me, sometimes it can be very isolating being the only woman. And that's why I like interacting in platforms like this where I get to talk to other women that are interested. And that's why we're trying to spark your interest. As a woman, you can do tech. Please come and join us. I will not just be alone <laughs> in all these big companies. We want to have more black women, more women. So what to expect really varies. It depends on what you're doing. There are some fields that are a lot more male-dominated than other fields. But the key remains be very good at what you do. Once you're very good at what you do, no one is... No one cares what your gender is or what your nationality is. You just want the person that will get the job done. Okay. I think yeah, oh, I'm think, sorry. Anybody yeah. adding anything? I think she has she, 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 she that's that's perfect. Okay. So that is the last question on the slide. We'll just go back to the questions from the chat room. Okay. The next question is from Michael and it's, it's it wants to know if there is school of thought or that you have sorry. There, there is a school of thought that you have to transition from data science to data analytics and AI. Is that true? School of thought. 
Yeah. Can you read the question again, please? So maybe, I, I'm thinking what you just want to know is that maybe there is a saying or people just have it that you have to transition from data science to data analytics and AI. So he wants to know if that is true. I would say no. Like I said already, data analytics is when you're not, what's it called? When you're not making use of machine learning, like you can do data analytics without using machine learning. And those are data cleaning, data collection, data visualization, information retriever, statistical inference, all those are data analytics. But when you start making use of machine learning, what's it called techniques, you're training what's it called data, then you're doing more of data science. And for AI, AI is when you actually go so deep in it and you're doing more of automation, like self-driving cars, you're working on all those kind of project like chatbot. Like you're trying to let what's it called computers learn on their own in a very high or technical way. That's AI. So I would actually tell you, no school of thought. If you have a what's it called, if you have the skills set for data analytics or data science, you're good to go for what's it called here. You just need to add some more little soft skills like TensorFlow, like Kera, all this kind of stuff. Like just a little more so it was a cost for soft skills to make yourself better at AI. Okay, thank you for asking that of So the next question is from Wayne Gonia. And um the question is, is it possible to apply um data science into filmmaking? So I would actually say yes, it's possible. There's nothing impossible to start with that. It's actually possible. And like I said already. If there was a called data set in your industry, which is a film industry, and depending on the problem you're trying to solve, the problem statement, if there's data attached to that problem statement, then trust me, you can try data science on film making, which I'm sure there will be what's called data, just depending on the kind of problem you're trying to solve. Data science is applicable to almost all fields. Like Bemi said, tech is applicable to almost all fields. Like Chaitan also said, so now there's what's it called? There's this thing, there's thing. There's art into what? There's art in at in what's it called in technology now all these design thinking UX design a uh, designer and her they actually combine both art and technology together so i would say it's possible so let me let me give you a quick idea so you're a filmmaker you produce movies or you film yeah produce movies and things like that now one way you can i would speak data science because i have a data science background maybe baby can help with other angles but one thing you can do is think of when you produce a movie, how many minutes does it typically take? How long does it typically take? What kind of people watch your movie when you produce it? What, yeah, there are different qualities of movies, right? Which one do people typically watch more than the other? Those are different data, data components or elements or whatever you want to call it that you can then put together, analyze it and derive, make a, a nice derivation from it. And you the best filmmaker in, in the world just by putting those components together analyzing it deriving an insight from it and applying it back into the film industry just so it can be better and at the end of the day they'll say oh we're going to we're going to made us do this she was the idea behind it, the brain behind it so yes you can always apply um technology into filmmaking thank you the next question is from Wingonia as well and um the question is how do you employ data science into getting clients for your business I can take that too. Um, so now think of, let, 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 let me ask a question. You can answer in the chat window. What is your business about? What do you sell? For example, I used to mentor a girl that used to that sells cake. And the question was, oh, I'm not getting, the problem was I don't used to get sales, this and this and that, blah, 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 blah. Now I asked her, tell me, what is, the, when you sell your cake, how many people typically buy in a week? Or how many people buy in a month? Now, when you have that number, what kind of cake do they typically buy, right? What kind of cake has the interest of people more? Now, the moment you get all of those numbers, think of all of the other questions you want to ask. The moment you get all of those, all of that data, convert it into information or analyze it. Again, it can be as simple as Excel. It doesn't have to be a Python code. It doesn't have to be SQL or SPSS or whatever statistical tool you want to use. It can be as simple as Excel. Collect that data and do a bar chart. I say, okay, what's the highest number, what's the highest performing number of, of cakes that people buy? Make a decision based on that. So this is applicable to all businesses. I'm using cake as a, as a case study, but it can be used across all business. Identify the key factors in your business, answer some questions, and collate those questions and determine, determine something for your business. So that's, that's pretty much how services I mean, based. 
Okay. So just to add to what was it called, Shaitan said, like more more like closely related. Let's say for example you have a store, like you sell various type of things, and you realize only one product is getting sold every day. Like like the what's it called? The frequency at which people are buying that product, it's a lot. You can actually do a batch at, like Shaitan said, do a batch at for all your what's it called? Or your order for all the products and see which one is actually not selling like it's not actually selling very well from there you can you have a lot of what's it called initiative on oh should i put this next to this maybe that's why people are not seeing it or they're not buying it so it actually depends on the kind of business you're doing like what you're doing then before after then you can decide on what kind of even you don't like maybe, like she said you don't have to do python excel will help you out for like to, to start with then after then you can decide to like push into what's it called all these programming skills and all I mean, the same thing applies with Netflix or in a bank. In data science, they'll say, can you predict the rate at which a person who borrows loan will get to pay back? It's as simple as that. You need data to make that work. The rate at which people will go into a store, what's the rate at which they will look at the, the, the things at the top top um, row or things at the bottom, then that makes you determine, oh, this is where to place it. You mentioned filmmaking in your, your business services-based filmmaking. That's excellent. I cannot give you a, a final answer on this is what you need to do. But it's for you to go back and research, based on all the things we have said, go back and research, identify the key components of filmmaking, and ask yourself questions, ask the important questions, and then analyze. Again, you can reach out to either of us when you actually have those answers, and we can help you out. Thank you. So the next question is from Fabrina, and um, Fabrina says, please, I studied agricultural education. Can I diversify into tech? Also, what sector of tech will be, will be best for me? I was actually going to take Fabrina's question. Like, so you are currently doing agri education. Trust me. The other part of it, like which of the what's it called tech would be good for you? We can't actually just jump on the what's it called jump to answer for you on the call like this is the one that would be good for you. That's why sometimes you need a mentor, like so they can actually sit with you properly, like have a conversation with you properly to get to know you better. And from there, you can actually decide. Like we said, tech is applicable to every area. And again, it comes to passion. Are you passionate about technology? Do you really want to like diversify into tech? And start with that. If your answer is yes, then there's so many, there's so many of the what's it called tech roles that you, have, you can actually venture into. So I would actually say you should try to connect either with any one of us at the end of the call. Then we can actually have a better conversation to get to know you better, to get to know the kind of skill set you have right now. And from there we can talk on what kind of what's it called aspect would be good for you. Yeah, please just to add to that, like. Also, the idea of this is not to make everybody jump into tech. Like, it's not it's not everybody that tech is for. Like, seriously, for some people, it might be that because I mean, talking about also, I'm going to answer the question related to how can I apply. Do you just? It's not just about wanting to apply data science. So you can say, oh, I'm using data science in this or in my job. And it's not really about that. All technology comes into place when you're trying to solve a problem. You know. So even in that, you're a Greek. If you decide to go with a Greek, I'm sure there are so many agricultural problems that can be solved with technology. So our aim is not to make you move over and become a Python developer and start building technology for a bank. Even in that, a Greek. If you have an understanding of technology, there's some problems that are existing in technology that you can solve with, that, that um, exist in agriculture that can be solved with technology. That's why I talked about cake. I had a problem. I didn't like that I was calculating all the time. And that was just cake baking. I decided to, you know, create a, a, a code that could do that, a software that could do that for me. So most times it comes from, so when you're thinking about how can I apply technology, think about what problems are existing and how can I solve it. I mean, I'm thinking of diversifying into tech. Rethink, is it really about moving into tech or applying tech to my current field? So please, it's not everybody. It doesn't have to be that you're moving tech because tech is booming. In that agri, you might find a very, very good, you might find a very, very good application of technology that only you can do because you already have an in-depth knowledge of agri. A software developer that only did computer science will not be able to solve that problem. It will be best for you because you understand that agri more than anybody else. So that's what I'd like to add. Okay, so we have two more, two more questions and two more minutes. The next question is, if you're my, and the first question is, is this mechanical engineering part of the tech world or is the tech world strictly software? 
Well, I think I've kind of already mentioned, tried to clarify those three things. So when we talk about tech or tech world, we're mainly talking about information technology. But, you know, we're talking about technology as a whole. Technology as a whole is just what we are using to solve a problem. So engineering, mechanical engineering, in fact, in UI, for example, you say mechanical engineering is part of faculty of technology. That's the broad technology. What technology just means is tools, process, how to get something done, what you are using to solve a problem. Technology can be blast furnace. Technology can be something as little as molding. Technology can be something as... But today that we're talking about technologies in, in the sense of information technology, IT, you know, so, um, yeah, so you can see that those three things are different. Mechanical engineering is from technology, different from in, in, information technology. You can watch a replay of this to see where I clarified those three things. Thank you, Bemi. And also, we are running out of time. The, next, the last question, I'm not sure it will let us answer it, but anyways, is from Fumi. Awesome presentation from all. Thanks a lot. I'm a graduate of Elect Elect. I, present, I presently work in the oil and gas industry, but have great passion for coding as well as the energy sector. Can you please shed light on how these two can be integrated? I think we answered this already, but... Less than a few seconds to answer if anybody wants to take it. I mean, I would still say the same thing. Like tech is applicable to all field. Like you, thank God you, you actually said it yourself. You have passion for technology or coding and all, which is actually good. And from there, we have a mentor in our, what's it called, mentorship program. She also did a lecture lecture. And right now she's more into develop, like development, cloud, doing more of coding as well we can to actually not say too much try to like you can connect with us at the end of the what's it called program at the end of the old session then we can actually speak more on that and the the, the main point is that what's it called tech is applicable to all what's it called almost all field and passion is needed thank you Thank and you all for joining. Thank you, Tayo. Really, really, really appreciate you. Bemi, thank you, Shay. Don't think you. And thank you. I wanted to see you all to show your faces now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to everyone. We really appreciate you. We thank you for like, I know two hour section might actually seem long to some people, but trust me, it's, it was actually worth it. For me, I, I got to learn. We learn every day. I'm learning from you as you're learning from me as well. I really want to right. say thank you. Our next webinar session will be coming up very soon and we'll be putting it out there again. And this time around, it might not be, it might still be around tech, but it might be around something else. But feel free to join, feel free to share with your, your people and her. And if you want to join our mentorship program, please connect with us, send us an email, and we'll be there for you. They should connect with us on LinkedIn. So, you guys, connect with us on LinkedIn. We're happy to, you know, continue this conversation there. And we have so many mentors. We have mentors in other fields as well. We have mentors in HR, like we have mentors in engineering. They are engineer right now, product engineers. So it depends on your field, depending on what you're doing right now. Just reach out to us and let us know more about you and what you're looking for. I'll be there to help. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good one. Thank you, everyone.